In this video, we're going to learn how to calculate the current, the induced current, in a rotating loop that's sitting in a magnetic field. And this is actually known better by a better, by a different name, which is the generator. This is how almost all modern methods of generating electricity work. It's basically by rotating a loop or a solenoid, a bunch of loops, in an external magnetic field. And so the problem goes something like this. We've got an external magnetic field, and which I've drawn here in blue, and we've got a metal loop, which is this little red circle that I've drawn here. And that red loop rotates about, let's call this the x-axis. So the loop is rotating about the x-axis. So if we look at it from the left, we see that when the loop is at an angle of zero degrees, it's, you see that it's perpendicular with the magnetic field, and then it gets to a steeper and steeper angle until it becomes parallel with the magnetic field. And it keeps rotating at a speed of, let's say, omega. This loop also has a little bit of resistance. So each loop, the loop itself acts like a resistor. And I'm going to say that this resistance is just R. So it could be anything. It might be an ohm, might be half an ohm. And what we want to find is the induced current as a function of time. So first of all, what physical law are we going to use to solve this problem? Well, this is an example of electromagnetic, electromagnetic induction, or a magnetic field inducing a current. And so we're going to use Faraday's law, or Faraday's law of induction. Now Faraday's law says that the induced EMF around the loop, so the total voltage dropped across this resistor, is equal to the negative derivative of the magnetic flux as a function of time. So to solve this problem, we need to start by finding the magnetic flux. And then once we have the EMF, we can figure out the current using Ohm's law. So I is equal to the induced EMF divided by the resistance of the coil, which we already know. So to calculate the magnetic flux phi B, what we need to do is integrate the dot product of the B field and the area vector dA, and we need to integrate this over the area of our loop, so over this area here. Now we know what B is, we know which direction it's pointing. Let's call this the Z direction. B is just equal to some magnitude times Z hat. So it's pointing straight in the Z direction. But the loop is actually changing its direction. And because this is an open surface, we could choose DA to point up or we could choose it to point down initially. I'm gonna choose it to point up just for simplicity. So initially, DA is pointing straight up. It's in the same direction of, of the magnetic field. But as the loop turns, DA turns with it. The direction that the area is pointing is changing. And so because we're taking a dot product, we need to expand this in terms of the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field. And so let's call this angle theta. So that's this little angle right here, theta. We know b dot dA is going to become b times dA times cosine of theta. So initially, theta is 0, dA and b are pointing in the same direction. Then it starts to increase. Then eventually it becomes 90 degrees. And then it gets larger than 90 degrees and keeps going on and on and on. So we need to take this integral. Now fortunately, because we're integrating over this area, over the surface, theta doesn't change. So it doesn't matter where our area vector is. So when we're integrating in this region, dA is pointing that way. Over here, it's pointing that way. So dA is always pointing in the same direction relative to the magnetic field. So cosine of theta is a constant. And similarly, the external magnetic field, I also said, was constant. And so we can pull both of those things out of the integral. So we have b times cosine theta times the integral of dA. And this is my absolute favorite kind of integral because when you add up all the little pieces of area over the surface of our loop, this just becomes A. 
So this whole thing is b times a times cosine of theta. Now this is great, we've made some progress, but now we need to take the time derivative of this, and I don't see any time dependence here. But remember at the beginning, we said that this loop has an angular speed omega, and so this is where our time dependence comes from. So if you remember your mechanics class, the change in theta over some time is equal to omega times t. So if theta is initially zero, then we can just say that this is theta. So if we write this in terms of time, we have b times a times cosine of omega t. And now we can take the derivative of this, the time derivative. So if we do that, we want d dt of our magnetic flux, which is b times a times cosine of omega t. Now, b and a are both constants. They don't change as a function of time. So we can pull them out of this derivative. So b times a times the time derivative of cosine omega t. And so you can either memorize this or look it up. Either one is fine. But the time derivative of cosine omega t is omega, omega times negative sine of omega t. So parentheses. So b altogether, we've got b times a times omega times negative sine of omega t. This is my derivative of the magnetic flux versus time. So that's great. We are almost done with this problem. All we need to do now is set this equal to the negative or set the EMF. So if we've got our loop, or I've been drawing that loop in red, that loop has some finite resistance. And really the resistance is distributed all over the loop, but I'm just drawing it as a single lumped piece here. So a single, it's as if there's a single resistor in that loop. And across that loop, we have our EMF. And so the EMF is negative d phi b dt. This is just Faraday's law. And so we put a negative sign out front of this, so that cancels with this negative sign somewhat conveniently. It's almost like I planned that. Uh, I didn't. B times A times omega times sine of omega t. And all we need to do is to find the current, I, is we just need to divide this whole thing by the resistance. We just need to divide this by R divide by r. And then we're done. So this is the answer. If we want, we can simplify this or desimplify it. Uh, because the area of a loop is pi times pi times a squared. So this would be our final answer in terms of the initial variables that we had for the induced current. So this says initially, when the loop is parallel, or when the loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field, so d a and b are pointing in the same direction. Initially, the change in magnetic flux is close to zero. And so we have very low induced EMF. But then as our loop starts to rotate, it gets higher and higher and higher. And the change in flux is greatest when d a and b are perpendicular to each other. So this is when the flux is changing the most rapidly and when we get the highest EMF as a function of time. And then it comes back down and it becomes anti-parallel. So d a and b are pointing in opposite directions. And then it flips around so it's perpendicular but they're in the other direction and then comes back. And so the EMF and the current as a function of time will look like this sine wave and this will keep going on and on forever. Now this is really convenient because this is exactly the waveform that we want for generators. This is what's called AC current. And this is one of the reasons that rotating things are so wonderful for electrical engineers like me to deal with is because they give us a perfect sine wave or ideally a perfect sine wave for our electrical current. 
Finally, I'd like to thank all my patrons on Patreon. Your support is greatly appreciated, and it is you who makes these videos possible. If you aren't currently a patron, to get early video access, behind-the-scenes footage, exclusive content, and join a like-minded community, click the link on screen or in the description below. Thanks for watching.